All right, howdy everybody, and welcome to the next installment of The Republic, The Seven-Headed Beast. Let's get right into this. This installment is Staging for our Empire, part six in the series, The Republic, The Seven-Headed Beast. In the previous installment of the Republic, the seven Hundred Beast series, we looked at how the spirit of the Republic of Rome was finally able to reestablish in the form of the United States. In this chapter, we are going to take a look at how the stage has been set for the Empire to click into place, how this beast is playing, is paying dragon honor to the history of those heads, kingdoms of the kings that came before it and briefly touch upon generations of mistaken teachings claiming a, quote, one world government in the end times. First, we need to take a look at how the U.S. became established as a superpower on the world stage for all to see. In the early part of the 20th century A.D., the United States was riding high in a sort of power vacuum it had helped to create. After the Spanish-American War, the remaining monarchical empires were busy holding on to colonial possessions. This allowed the U.S. to project to the world a statement of their own might. In 1907, President Theodore Roosevelt sent what is now known as the Great White Fleet across the Earth's oceans as a demonstration of wealth and power to the other nations. This fleet of white painted battleships would visit foreign harbors, basically stating, greetings, we're here in the name of peace from the United States of America. Got it? At the same time, the US was learning lessons from occupying former Spanish colonies. As Spain had shown and Great Britain and France, etc., etc. It wasn't worth the effort to hold conquered territory with an iron fist. Forming an exploitative alliance was much easier. The U.S. would hone this skill over the next several decades. Regardless of how much people want to rewrite history, the Great War, or uh, the war to end all wars, Oops, World War I was in a stalemate until the United States entered the war on the side of the allied nations of France and the United Kingdom. The entry of the U.S. in 1917 into a war started in 1914 weighed the scale heavily against the nation of Germany and their allies. World War II started much the same way. In 1939, when Germany and the USSR jointly invaded Poland, due to entangling alliances by treaty, France and the UK declared war on Germany. This fighting continued for three years, 1939, 1940, and 1941, before the event of Pearl Harbor instigated the US to once again join up with France and the UK and later the USSR, to defeat Germany, Italy, and Japan. Sitting in the relatively safe isolation of North America, the United States became an industrial powerhouse as such that had never been seen before. Not only was U.S. industry building the mighty war machine of the U.S. armed forces, it was also supplying weapons en masse for the allied nations and, quote, free armies. That's citizens of Axis-occupied lands who escaped to fight another day. In all theaters of war, Asia, Africa, Europe, and the Pacific. Additionally, both the friend and enemy nations had their industries and agriculture utterly destroyed. They were quite literally in smoking, ruinous heaps. Enter George C. Marshall, Secretary of State of the U.S. and originator of the Marshall Plan. 
In short, as the United States was sitting on a massive surplus of industrial output and huge sums of cash from being the world's arms dealer, the U.S. would loan billions of dollars to former European World War II allies and enemies so that these nations could rebuild their economies and countries. Of the major players, only the USSR chose not to participate in the Marshall Plan. Similar effort was put into rebuilding East Asia under the Reconstruction. As a result, perhaps not surprisingly, this saw the rise of essentially the same major players as the new industrial powerhouses. France, Italy, Japan, the then existing West Germany, and the United Kingdom. Additionally, the U.S. allowed funds from this program to be used to purchase manufactured goods made in Canada also, as they too were intact after the war, although with a much smaller industrial footprint than the U.S. Over the next few decades, each of these nations would become vastly wealthy in their own rights, providing essential tools for modern living and convenience there are scarcely any modern contrivances without the fingerprint of one of these nations upon it. Well, as with any group that wants to tout their achievement and hold on to what it has accomplished dearly, these nations formed a club. Thus started the Group of Seven. The Group of Seven, or G7 Industrialized Nations, or just G7, was ostensibly started in response to the oil crisis that started by the OPEC nations in the early 1970s. You will hear numbers and percentages about industrial capacity, GDP, debt, and so on, but these are distractions. These seven nations are in the G7 mainly because of the wealth that they hold. It combined a full two-thirds of the world's wealth, as the wealth of the world is measured. That is 66%. That's another type of fingerprint there, isn't it? Now, you may be asking, how are these democracies like the client kingdoms of Rome? As with Rome's client kingdoms, these client democracies are responsible for their own defense. Should they get into trouble militarily, the U.S. will tip the scale with their own military. If they get into a financial pickle, again, the U.S. will happily loan, with interest, from its coffers of paper and digital money. These client democracies get a form of self-autonomy with a U.S.-backed sort of regional authority. We can see this enforced by treaties and accords all over Earth where the United States is a co-signer with one or more of the G7 nations and their surrounding neighbors. In exchange, the U.S. gets a benefit of tax revenue by a licensing of U.S. industry and technology, often hidden in corporate agreements and mergers. It is in these that the seven-headed beast is able to rule the world by tribute and agreements with the trait of a leopard hiding in plain sight. And the seven heads, which are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, and there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, that is Rome at the time John wrote Revelation, and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is one of the seven and goeth into perdition. Now it seems that the G7 is a fit for a type of tribute to the seven-headed beast of Revelation. What about the ten horns with crowns? I believe that the G7 nations will provide the first seven horns and crowns, horns being kings and crowns being their authority. And the other three, you ask? This remains to be seen. However, as of 2020, 
it has been suggested that an invitation be extended to Australia, India, and South Korea, each powerful in both industry and military too. The G7 is a club and entry is limited. Their power is with a small people, not all the nations in the world. It's a reference to Daniel 11. Back in the U.S., though, it would appear from a neutral view that regardless of the direction to the right or to the left politically, the shift from democratic republic to democratic empire is almost upon us. As with, as with Rome, with Julius Caesar, we need only look for the rise of the one man to bring foreign and domestic affairs into check and under their supreme authority to rule over it. In the next installment of The Republic, The Seven-Headed Beast, we will take a brief look at the symbology of government and society that the United States has adopted, not only from Rome, but the other heads of the beast as well. Okay, everybody. I thank you for tuning in, and I hope this is, is helpful to those of you that are seeking out this information to break free from uh, the lies of the pulpits and the lies of the society we live in. At any rate, please like, share, and subscribe with those that will listen. I love you all, and we will see you very soon. Bye.